Hello, it's David. Today, just a short one, I'm going to be taking my uh, falcon out of the case, uh, resoldering some of the um, expansion lines, and uh, changing this fan out because I, I disabled this fan a little while ago because it was it was broken and it didn't really need it. But if I'm going to be putting a an accelerator card under my keyboard, it's going to get warm, so I need to put the fan back in. So I've got a new fan from Exos. I'm going to be replacing that, uh, and I'm having some problems. This, this is the DFB1 uh, revision 4. This is in the, the bring up configuration. It's just got a 33 chip. Uh, it's just running at the moment. It's supposed to just be running on the 60 megahertz motherboard clock, um, and it doesn't have any of the the ROM or the uh, SD RAM fitted. And it's not getting anywhere because when it uh, makes that initial read to um, address zero, uh, which maps to the ROM in the Falcon, um, it's just throwing a bus error. So that implies that we've got a, a problem with connectivity. So I'm going to whip this out. I'm going to just resolder because we have had some problems in the past with the with connectivity on the expansion port here. This is the uh, the new DFB one R four, by the way. That's new, FPU on board. Hope we can get that to work. No debug headers, so it should fit with the power supply uh, in, in place. Uh, four uh, configuration jumpers and interchangeable crystal. Uh, so this I'm hoping is gonna be the, the last revision. But at the moment it doesn't work. So what can we do to fix that? I suspect these, to be honest, these have, uh, I've needed to reseat my cards a lot in the past just to try and get something to uh, to recognize it. So to be honest, I, I don't think that they're in good order. So we're gonna flip it over and resolder those. Let's see how tight the RAM card is compared to the DFB1 card. Ah. That I suspect tells us a little bit about how worn out that expansion is after all the different DFB cards have gone in and out. Goodness me. Why do they didn't, didn't just put SIM slots on these boards? Beyond me. What a pain. And of course the ROM is under there. To get the ROM you have to pull that out every time. And all we've done is fitted sims in these things anyway. Just a sim slot would be nice, 72 pin sim. Atari did 30 pin sims on the STE, why not just move up a step? Bizarre. Uh, right, and you can see here is where I have cut the, uh, the fan cable, so that will also need repairing. So let's flip it over. And uh, or let's unscrew these first, then flip it over and get the motherboard out. I'm also going to remove that mod wire for the uh, the FPU data strobe line that was required for the uh, DFB uh, revision three B. Didn't work very well, to be honest. So I'm I'm just. I dropped it, put the FPU on board, and we, uh, we'll just remove that mod line, won't require that anymore. It was optional anyway. Includes four megabytes of RAM, wow. DFB1 R3 had 128. Got heat sinks here on the original processor and on the uh, DMA chip. I did have a heat sink on the combat as well, but that uh, that fell off. Not sure it's really needed. Okay, then hopefully we just need to lift from the front, disentangling the expansion joystick ports. 
and then just slide forwards. Oh, something's hooked. There we go. Okay. Don't know what that was. Maybe just uh, just the shielding, I think. And a very dusty but surprisingly clean bottom case comes away. This back panel has always annoyed me. Right. Now, how does the shield detach? I don't think I've ever been uh, uh, lower down than this, to be honest. Not on my board, anyway. This, my original Falcon from 92. Okay, there's something over here holding it down. Just be this little tab. Yes, these little tabs are a little bit overlapping. to unscrew those rear ports. Oh, I suspect the answer is yes. That's annoying. I think I might accidentally forget to refit this thin bit of shielding when I'm done. God knows I haven't seen the top shielding for this uh, machine in years and years. Took this to university with me in 1996. It was a bit old in the tooth then. Couldn't do ethernet. Couldn't get it hooked up to the internet at uh, uh, at university. Not in my first year. My second year, I bought a uh, PC, my first PC. That obviously could be hooked up to the internet, and I discovered through the wonders of Linux uh, that I could then piggyback at my Falcon with a slip or I think probably PPB connection uh, off the back of my. PC. Later on I managed to buy a uh, uh, cartridge Ethernet, the Ethernet. That is tight around the uh, RF port, I suppose that, that is its purpose. And then with the uh, addition of a little hub, my falcon was on the uh, on the internet permanently through my uh, all the time it's turned on at least through my um, third and fourth years. That was running the old Knafs German Mint Distribution KGMD, basically a command line Unix. Hmm. The old Mintos.
I don't think we'll be seeing this again. Quite enough of that. Anyway, to the point of that diversion about when my Falcon was on the internet at university was that the top cover had long gone, 1996. I actually fitted a three and a half inch hard disk into the space where the floppy was with an adapter, uh, ran the cable out the back for CD-ROM uh, and the floppy. So the floppy, the floppy was just a cable dangling out the, at the back of the machine. Uh, so at that point, the top shielding had long gone. Right, so virginal back of board. Look how clean that is. The dark, the lovely dark. Saw the mask. Splendid. And these are the expansion headers here. This one, the address line, is the one that we probably suspect. Can't see any immediate issues with it. But I don't think a reflow will hurt. And whilst we're here, we'll swap out that fan. Hello to the lovely Exos hydraulic bearing DC brushless replacement. So interestingly, this one comes with a connector. Wasn't intended to use the connector. I don't know what's under that blob of glue. We could potentially lift the glue. Maybe we find somewhere where we could fit some header or something. But I think what I'll do is just cut the cable and, and, and join it here. So that will need to come through there, and then we'll fit Hmm. They're not actually hex cutouts. on out. Okay, so I think what I might do is just take the opportunity to test that fan before I wire everything up. And just so happens I've got a couple of pump cables laying around here, wired up to my power supply. So let's have a look. We've got grey as ground and magenta is live or positive I should say and we should set this for 12 volts. I've got 12 volts half an amp that seems a bit excessive. Let's drop that down to uh, 100 milliamps to start with. There we are, that's drawing about 75 milliamps. I'll be honest, doesn't sound great. Loosening and tightening the screws does not appear to have much effect. Oh well, 
I'm more interested in its ability to shift air than I am in its uh, oral aesthetics at the moment. So uh, I am going to consider that good enough. So let's try and split these cables. So this is my old fence ply. There we go. I'm going to allow myself a little bit of working room. something to play with. All right, first things first, let's not forget the heat shrink. Bit of heat shrink. We'll cut that in half. I forget. Let's tin up these ends. Solid core wire, by the look of it, on the uh, on the old fan, uh, and stranded, stranded on the new one. So tinning a bit less important on the old one here. Now this is where my technique will sorely be called into question. If there's a good way of doing this, I have yet to perfect it. But that doesn't seem too bad. one on top of the other a little bit, a degree of stability. Yeah. 
There we go. Now, I'll be honest, I'm nervous about powering this up to test it um, when it's actually uh, in circuit now. So I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm just going to apply the heat shrink and hope for the best. But uh, touching wood, I don't think there's too much that can go wrong with that. So for heat shrink, we're looking at something in the region of 150 degrees on the air gun. Try and aim it away from anything on the motherboard. Not that 150 degrees should cause any trouble. I think this technically is 125 degrees, but in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay, and that can tuck away under there, hopefully. Good, so part one. Part two is to remove my FPU data select mod, which is just this one wire attached to, uh, uh, to pin three of U62. Can do this in situ, I think. There we go. I soldered actually uh, uh, in vitro um, originally. That's just a cut down DuPont wire. But I think that's absolutely fine like that. Just want to be careful about melting the. Uh, maybe I will pull that just to clean it up. Don't want to melt the pad. So uh, I don't have a proper IC puller. But if we're gentle with a flathead. I think we can encourage it out. Come on. Oop. Bit too much encouragement. But nothing damaged. You see all I've got there is just a little blob of solder on pin three, which I would like to wick away. acceptable. So let's return that back to its correct place. There we go. Now there are other modifications I want to do in the future so to be honest I might not put the base shielding back on when I go back to testing this. The old MV RAM clock could do with changing and well, the board is filthy anyway. When I finish the development of the DFB boosters, I will give this a proper scrub. I suspect the capacitors need changing. This is you know, genuinely... None, none of these on here have been changed. The only work this board has had in the past was uh, to replace the FPU uh, socket, which I absolutely made a mess of uh, in about 1998. <laughs> Actually, no, probably 96 again, 96, 97. Uh, so... Uh, um, I'm, that's why I don't think it's actually been out of the shell. All the work's been done on the top. You see how filthy this is. Uh, so it, it probably doesn't make sense to put it all back now. But let's uh, have a quick look at our uh, primary objective today. Okay, so I'll try to bring you in closer here so that you can see this one and this one without me, uh, without hopefully uh, getting too much in the way. I'm going to use this nasty cheap liquid no clean flux because I really don't want the bottom of my board to be completely sticky and filthy and I don't have time to clean it all now. So I'm just going to 
liberally apply some of this for now. This dries so quickly, I'll probably only do half at a time. And who knows what side of, sort of solder this had on it. I don't know whether this predates the reduction of hazardous substances. Uh, system where uh, it's all going to go lead free so instead of adding my own leaded material to the mix I'm just going to reflow what's there although there really is not very much there by the look of things Yeah, I'm not 100% convinced by this flux either. I might have to leave the open bottle nearby and apply a much shorter measure. Is that the power line? There's really not a lot of sold on these, is there? I'm really not seeing much reflowing. I may have to uh, may have to resort to the big guns after all. Let's apply a an overkill volume of proper flux. Uh, I'm going to be cleaning this for days now. But flowing, that now does seem to be. Flux is important, boys and girls. Doing this at 290 degrees, by the way. Don't want to damage this board. As it's my real one. Probably shouldn't be working on it, really, but I do have another Falcon board, but it's in a state of disrepair. And that's my next project. If I can get DFV1 to work, fingers crossed, been doing it on and on, on and off now for about 18 months. If I can get DFV1 to work, then my next big project is going to be trying to repair a pretty manky falcon board that's got a missing CPU, it's got all of these headers resoldered. hope to get there. Okay, so I'll be honest, that's going to need some more cleaning up, but I think I want to go back and make sure that that boots. First of all, gosh this really needs a clean. I'm hoping, as I say, if we can get DFP1 to work I can almost retire this fork and go and concentrate on my salvage board. This can then go properly back in this case with its lid on and that will be my main machine for some software work. I'd like to do some software work, some more software work with the falcon. 
been distracted by hardware for too long. Okay, so I'm going to put a few screws back in and I'm going to uh, run off and, uh, and test our handiwork. Okay, well after a bit of testing it turns out that uh, it still doesn't work. Um, I put a the previous version, a DFB, uh, DFB1 uh, Rev 3B in, this is the one that's limited to uh, 40 megahertz. I put that in uh, and that worked first time. Um, so I didn't have to reseat it. So hopefully it's fixed my reseating issues. Uh, the fan uh, works fine, although it does sound like a jumbo jet taking off. Speaking of which, that is a jumbo jet taking off. Sorry about that. Um, so that's good. But it does imply that the problem is maybe my board rather than on uh, the Falcon side. So I am just going to go through uh, the pins here and zap them out. I had measured the pins and they seemed to me to be absolutely fine, but um, clearly not uh, clearly not working for me. Perhaps there's, I don't think a shorts would do it. The, the symptoms are that I get uh, that um, AS, the address strobe, uh, fires, but I never get the DTAC from the Falcon. Instead, we get a bus error 100 cycles later which is what you normally see if you ask for an impossible address. So the, ad the address lines are the uh, other ones under question. So I'm just going to whiz through here and, uh, and beep out the uh, 22 address lines from the pin to the socket. OK, so this pin out here is the uh, the right hand end of the main connector so we don't use the first two uh, pins uh, so it goes a1 2 3 4 5 6 along here until it hits uh, the VCC uh, and pin so pin 23 and VCC I think so I'm going to work my way along that way and we're going to pick these out here so for example a1 is C4 so that's a B C one, two, three, four, that should be A1. Yep, we'll just check it against A2 and the neighbours while we're at it. Okay, so A1 seems fine. Then there's a jump across the board to A2, which is D13. That should be A2. Is it shorted to A1? No. Okay, and I'm going to uh, carry on like this make sure the problem is not on my board. Cue the montage. So all 23 address lines appear to connect from the processor to the pins. So the only other real thing that we could think about is are the um, pins shorted to uh, uh, shorted to 5 volts. Um, the, if they were shorted to ground, you'd expect the first one to work because they all should be zero. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly whistle through here and buzz it out against uh, 5 volts but I'm not really expecting anything there because I would, I would imagine that we'd see other problems uh, before then. Now all the address lines do go through the CPLD. The CPLD, they're all set to um, input, so they shouldn't be having any effect. But of course, if there were something wrong with the CPLD here or it were um, driving, um, you know, if it was shorted here or if, if it was driving um, a, uh, an address line high by mistake, then that would cause the behavior. But when probing these, I'm, I'm not seeing it. So I think this is really my last uh, shout uh, at picking this up uh, before I really have to go back and, and start scratching my head properly. So uh, five volts should be available at this pin here, and it'll be one of these on the, there we go, on the crystal. So that's five volts. Uh, just double check that on the um, on the uh, processor. That should be five volts. Yeah, there we go. Right. So I'm just going to whiz down these lines. None of these should be five until we actually get to the VCC rail, which is that one there. 
so by the by the pin header that's VCC so So none of them appear to be shorted or even with a reasonable resistance to VCC. So what's going on? Obviously the next thoughts turn to the CPLD, but as I say, if we're, the logic is measuring it uh, as fine, it may be that we need to get the scope on there to see if there's sort of, sort of an in-between logic level which my probe is determining as zero, but which the falcon can't. Don't know. A little bit confusing now. I think what I may have to do is to uh, solder some piggyback headers on here and uh, to allow me to investigate with a bit more ease. Such a shame. I could try cleaning up. Actually, that's very sticky. That is very sticky. I could try cleaning up the, uh, um, the CPU socket. We've that a few times, getting some contact cleaner in there. Perhaps it's a contact between the CPU and this, but as I say, this does appear to drive low, but maybe it's just got a, a bit of a high resistance. So that's uh, uh, that's probably what I'll pursue next, uh, along with the solder header. And uh, I'll let you know my outcome.